to Lips and to the BIA for the invitation to speak to you this evening. It's, it's a true honor to be part of this event in memory of Gina and to be giving a talk about Sinop, a place that we both love. Uh, and indeed, uh, our very first interaction, which was about a piece uh, for Heritage Turkey, I didn't realize um, that was uh, Gina's baby. I learned that Gina had been part of the Chiplet excavation just outside Gina, uh, with uh, Stephen Hill, as we've heard. And it was clear how important that time that she spent in Sinop was to her. At that point, I had only been to Sinop once, but, it was already but I was already falling under its spell. Our permit situation, however, was uncertain. I remember thinking, I hope I get the chance to go back and experience Sinop the way that Gina had. I never had the opportunity to meet Gina in person, unfortunately, but she was a joy to work with and had that rare gift of being very human, warm and present in email. That's just such a wonderful thing. And we continued to bond about Sinop over the years as we corresponded about various Heritage Turkey and Anton Studies manuscripts. It's been really lovely to hear more about Gina tonight. Um, and it's clear that she will be um, deeply missed um, by all. In this talk, I'm going to focus on Sinop in the 4th and 3rd centuries BCE, the late classical and early Hellenistic periods, a time of prosperity and transformation in the, uh, in the ancient Greek settlement known as Sinope. Thematically, my aim is to demonstrate how Sinope was connected to wider transformations in the Black Sea during this period, focusing on mobility, agricultural production, and prosperity to display as themes. In doing so, I want to take this opportunity to showcase recent research and archaeological work that is being done in Sinop. Sinop on the north coast of Turkey is blessed with two natural harbors. It was the most strategic port in the Black Sea region uh, from antiquity until the Crimean War. And although today you are likely to see yachts and fishing boats, in the harbors, large tankers still take shelter there when storms threaten. This connection to the sea was key to the foundation of ancient Sinope as a Greek settlement around 630 <coughs> BCE, which ancient textual traditions connect with Ionian Greeks from Miletus on the west coast of Turkey, as well as its continued involvement in the movement of goods and ideas around the Black Sea during the first millennium BCE. It was this Black Sea connection that first brought me to Sinope in 2013, to meet with Owen Duden to discuss involvement in a new excavation as part of his Sinop Regional Archaeological Project, or SRAP, which had previously conducted archaeological survey in the hinterland of Sinop. Up to that point, my research had focused on the northern and eastern regions of the Black Sea. Um, and in addition to immediately, almost, uh, almost immediately falling for Sinop, its people, food, and natural beauty, something similar to what Gina must have experienced, I imagine, my conversations with Owen made it clear um, that, uh, not, that, not only the, that not only is the archaeology of Sinop fascinating in its own right, but that there were a whole host of connections with the rest of the Black Sea in, ancient, in the ancient Greek period that had yet to be fully explored. For various practical, historiographic, and geographic reasons, and geopolitical reasons, traditionally the south coast of the Black Sea has been less studied archaeologically and is not well integrated into larger Black Sea narratives of the first millennium BCE. The foundation of Sinope in the later 7th century uh, is part of a phenomenon usually called ancient Greek colonization. And indeed, it was one of many new Greek settlements that were established on the coast of the Black Sea in the 7th and 6th centuries BCE. Relatively little is known about these earliest phases of ancient Sinope, although it is clear that the settlement was located on the neck of the Bosch-Tepe Peninsula. From the 4th century BCE, however, the evidence for the urban form of Sinope, its connections to its hinterland, and interactions with the rest of the Black Sea world grows exponentially, including material that has long been known, such as Sinope and amphorae that are found in large numbers around the Black Sea, as well as, um, as, well as new results of archaeological work that has been conducted in the last 10 years or so by the Sinope Museum, Turkish, and international colleagues. The 4th century and early 3rd centuries BCE were a period of dynamic mobility and prosperity in the Black Sea region more generally. On one hand, there was a proliferation of political and economic networks between Black Sea, Poles, or Greek cities. Intensive trade of wine and oil, as demonstrated by the amphorae from this period, uh, was part of a highly competitive economy based on surplus agricultural production and intensified diplomatic relationships, as well as the mobility of people within the Black Sea region. In addition, 
the late classical and Hellenistic periods were characterized by intensified contacts between the Greek communities in the Black Sea and those in the Mediterranean. On the other hand, in the wake of what Hammond uh, has long termed the collapse of the leading powers in mainland Greece and the weakening of the Persian control of Anatolia, new political dynasties and authoritarian rule developed in Greek settlements, and we can see the rise of regional monarchies around the Black Sea, including the Thracians, Scythians, and Colchians. These kingdoms inserted a new element of hierarchical power relationships into the previous Greek city-based networks of the Black Sea region and fostered an intercollective connected political elite. These factors combined to make the fourth and early third centuries a time of prosperity and competition in the Black Sea. The Greek settlements were part of what Atma has, uh, has termed a loose and competitive network, but due to their relative geographic isolation and distance from each other, they were dependent on their own power, enhancing the role of elite competition in order to maintain autonomy. Due to the greater amount of archaeological research, uh, due to a greater amount of archaeological research, more is known about these dynamics on the northern and western coast of the Black Sea. But the picture emerging from Sinop makes it clear that ancient Sinope was deeply enmeshed in these networks. For the rest of this talk, I want to elaborate on these connections through the themes of mobility, agricultural hinterlands, and prosperity and display. Evidence for significant movement of people and goods from this period from Sinop, uh, sorry, excuse me. Evidence for, the, for significant movement of people and goods from this period from Sinop comes from in the form of inscriptions, texts, and pottery, particularly amphorae and roof tiles. This evidence is perhaps best known um, of the things that I will present tonight, but it is important to put it in its Black Sea context. While both Eastern and Western routes around the Black Sea were known in antiquity, it was only in the 4th century BC that the eastern route along the south coast became popular, making Sinop a notable port, port, notable port along this route, including the option to cut across to the, the sea to Crimea in the north following central currents. The increased use of this east, eastern route coincides with a marked increase in the evidence for people um, from Sinop moving around the Black Sea and into the Mediterranean. This, uh, this comes from textual evidence, including epitaphs, decrees, and textual accounts, which has been co compiled by Lydia Muscu and demonstrates that people from Sinop had diplomatic relationships with a variety of Greek cities on the north and west coast of the Black Sea. In addition, textual sources uh, document the movement of populations from, Sinop, uh, from the Sinop region uh, to the Bosporan Kingdom on the north coast of the Black Sea, presumably as agricultural labor. This evidence suggests that Sinop was fully integrated into the networks of movement demonstrated by other Greek settlements from the same period, particularly from the northern and west coasts. Sinopeans were also attested uh, in the Mediterranean, and here the mobility, at least that, which, that what, at least what was recorded, included cultural mobility. For example, there were 30 people from Sinop documented in Athens from the 4th to 2nd centuries BCE, including fam a family of playwrights and the philosopher Diogenes. Sinopeans were also in Rhodes and even Egypt and the Persian Empire during this period. This amount of Black Sea mobility uh, to the Mediterranean is only equaled by the Bosporan Kingdom on the north coast, which famously had close uh, trade and diplomatic links with Athens. At least some of the relationships between Sinopeans and other places in the Black Sea were likely connected with trade in some way. And it is in that context that we find the other clear evidence for connections between Sinope and the rest of the Black Sea period, namely the clay storage jars or amphorae, as well as roof tiles that were exported in large quantities from Sinope in the fourth and third centuries BCE. Sinope and amphorae are very recognizable in terms of their shape, their clay fabric, pinky orange with black flecks, and especially the stamps that were added to their shoulder handles. These stamps identified the emperor manufacturer, as well as the name of the person who held the title of Astinomos, or city official in that year, making them incredibly useful diagnostic and typological tool. <coughs> amphorae were typically used to transport wine and oil by sea. Sinop Sinopean amphorae were likely used for both wine and oil export, although there is some debate about the latter. Regardless, the patterns and quantities of Sinopean amphorae found in black, in, around the Black Sea suggest that these exports from Sinop dominated the market, particularly in the second part of the 4th century and the first half of the 3rd. 
For example, Sinopean amphorae count for up to half the amphorae found at Olvia, in the north uh, coast of the Black Sea, uh, in the later 4th and 1st part of the 3rd century BCE. In addition, in addition to amphorae, tiles, luteria, and architectural terracotta were imported to Olvia from Sinope. And in the later 4th century BCE, there were more Sinopean youth tiles used than locally produced ones. In the Western Black Sea region, Sinope and Amphrae were found in large numbers at the coastal Greek centers like Histria, and in smaller land numbers inland in Thracian centers. Well, for the East Coast, uh, Sinope was the main trading par partner for settlements like Pichpinari from around 325 BCE, based on the quantities of Sinopean coins, Amphrae, tile, and tiles found in both settlement and burial contexts. Sinope and Amphrae also made their way into the eastern, eastern Mediterranean, albeit in smaller numbers. Since good quality wine and oil were already widely available in the Aegean, it is thought that these Sinope and Amphrae were reused for the export of fish from the Black Sea, a luxury that we know was consumed in the Mediterranean. While the amphorae and other goods from Sinope are useful in reconstructing trade networks and establishing the dominance of Sinope in certain markets in the 4th and 3rd centuries BCE, they also suggest that agricultural production and associated industries were significantly increased at Sinop during this period, which brings us to thinking about agricultural hinterlands. Indeed, a key driver for Black Sea prosperity in this period was the trade of agricultural products, in particular wine and oil transferred in Ansbury, as we've seen for Sinope, and grain that was exported from the north coast of the Black Sea. In order to create surplus uh, of these goods for export, many of the Greek centers set about expanding their agricultural hinterlands during the fourth century BCE. As Owen Dunin and I have recently argued in an Anastolian studies paper, there are some clear similarities in the nature of these expansions, including increased numbers of settlements, intensified uh, agricultural infrastructure, new connections via road and path networks, and the inclusion of dependent territories beyond the traditional Quora. Evidence from the better studied northern and western coasts, where large plains were put to agricultural production in this period, includes large divided field systems, like you see here, with farmhouses and facilities for agricultural processing and storage, road networks, and clear evidence for new non greek communities becoming part of the extended agricultural hinterlands. The hinterland of Sinop, however, like most of the ancient Greek settlements on the south coast of the Black Sea, is dominated by the foothills of the Pontic Mountains. Here you can see very hazily in the background. I love this picture um, from the Ludwig Buddha's archive showing Sinop in the 1950s, and you can just get a sense of how much the city has grown uh, since then. Um, and then I've lost my So. The hinterland of Sinop has, uh, is dominated by the foothills of the Pontic Mountain, which is very different from the steppe landscape of the north, northern Black Sea, so perhaps we wouldn't expect large arable field systems here. Nonetheless, the, uh, um, the regional survey conducted by the Sinop Regional Archaeological Project from 1997 to 2012 has indicated that the 4th century was an important point of transformation in the hinterland of Sinop as well. Prior to this period, survey results showed Few to no uh, pottery from Sinop uh, made its way into the settlements in the foothills. This seems to indicate that there was little interaction, uh, at least in terms of uh, that type of trade, between Sinop and the people living inland. Instead, with its excellent harbors, it appears that early Sinop was focused on the sea. In the 4th century BC, however, amphorae and finewares would suddenly appear at many sites in the hinterland of Sinop. These sites include newly established coastal settlements, as well as evidence for imports at established local settlements along inland riverine routes. The Basque Tape Peninsula, marked with the red arrow here, was also developed with settlements in this period, with likely 12 to 15 farms along the west and, co and south facing slopes of the headland. In addition to settlement on Basque Tape, cultivation of olive trees and grapevines to supply this export market must have taken place in fertile valleys uh, and plains around the ancient port of Sinop. Indeed, Strabo mentions the prolific olive production south and east of Sinop several times. Most of the new 4th century BC sites identified by the SRAP survey 
were set uh, on terraces within a half a kilometer of the coast and overlooking small fertile valleys open to narrow, narrow coastal landings. At most of these sites, like Kajiolu, uh, Greek pottery and some handmade loaf wares were documented. It's possible that these sites represent small settlements with an agricultural focus, or that they played a role in transporting the agricultural produce by sea to the harbor of Sinop for processing and or export. And indeed, the Hellenistic emperor production sites that have been ex ex excavated at Zeytunlink and Nisekoi on the south shore of the Bastafe Peninsula emphasize the close links between this production and the sea, uh, seaward oriented nature of the trade. In addition to coastal sites, in the 4th century, pottery from Sinope appeared uh, in established local settlements, especially along the river, river valleys. An example of this is Iliana Nyeri, a coastal site uh, where both local wares and Greek pottery were collected in the survey. Its location at the mouth of the Kyrgyzha uh, River Valley and the mixed nature of the assemblage may indicate that it was a gateway to an important local community along that river, which had a major stronghold at Tingirtape in the foothills. It is difficult to say what type of relationship these inland sites had with Sinope, but they were likely involved uh, in uh, trade of natural resources, like timber, uh, as Owen Dunant has recently argued. This provides an interesting contrast with other uh, parts of the Black Sea, where evidence suggests that agricultural production was achieved through the use of dependent labor from local populations. Despite these differences at Sinope, as in other Greek centers around the Black Sea, increasingly dynamic networks of exchange, diplomacy, and competition set up conditions where the increased exploitation of rural hinterlands was desirable, and new groups with neighboring uh, and new relationships with neighboring populations were made for, uh, possible and necessary. Trade in agricultural products, natural resources, fish, and enslaved people, no doubt was a key factor in the prosperity that is evident in the Black Sea region in the 4th and 3rd centuries BCE. One way this increased prosperity can be seen is in the expansion and monumentalization of the Greek urban centers. For example, at Olvia uh, in the Northwest, there were extensive building activities with many Sinopean roof tiles, and a reorganization of the city's layout after a fire in 331 BCE. While at Pantapea, the capital of the Bosporan Kingdom, the Acropolis was, uh, of the city was elaborated with a palace-type structure in this period. For many of the Greek centers, the 4th and 3rd centuries BCE were also a period of constructing or renewing urban fortification systems. These include new fortifications at Tiras, Ovia, Nymphaeon, Odessa, Calatis, and Mesembria, uh, the ones marked in red, and significant expansion of existing fortifications undertaken at Heraclea Pontica, Histria, Persnesis, Pantacapan, among others. The expansion of territory and competition of resources that uh, competition for resources that characterized this period meant that there were inevitable conflicts between Greek cities and their neighbors, um, as well as with each other. And these fortifications served important defensive functions. But as with medieval castles, for example, Fortifications can also be symbolic displays of strength and prosperity. And this spate of stone fortification building around the Black Sea in this period contributed to that loose competitive network the Greek centers were part of. At Sinope, or at Sinop, sorry, the fortifications of the Calais, or the fortified, of the ancient fortress, welcome you to the city, along with Diogenes, its celebrated philosopher's son. As a result of the work that we have done uh, with Sinop Calais excavations, uh, the prominent Hellenistic fortification wall at the west side of the Calais, which you can see part of here, can now also be understood in the same context with the other fourth to third century fortifications in the Black Sea that I mentioned, part of the same fortification building boom. Our first five seasons of the project included stratigraphic excavation in the area of the best surviving section of the Hellenistic fortification wall together with detailed topographic and geophysical survey. These have provided a rich and unparalleled starting point for understanding the construction, chronology, and morphology of the wall. The 
fortification wells of the Calais have long been the most visible archaeological feature in the town. The Hellenistic part of the wall of the Calais, sorry, ran west, uh, northwest to southeast across a high point on the neck of the Bastete Peninsula, and still survives today, preserved to a height of 10 to 15 meters in many areas, albeit with later Roman, Byzantine, Seljuk, Ottoman, and modern additions. The line of the original Hellenistic defenses, as uh, outlined here in red, uh, was a curtain wall over 300 meters long, with beveled corner towers at each end, and at least four further towers punctuating, punctuating the curtain at strategic intervals. These are towers T30 and T30A to E on this plan. The best surviving section of the wall is located at the northwest end in the Sinop Palais Excavations project area. This includes the Northern Hellenistic Tower, T30, with its upper portions rebuilt, an adjoining section of uh, the Hellenistic Wall, still standing, although with all, uh, also with upper portions rebuilt and restored, as well as a section of foundations of, and lower courses of the Hellenistic Wall, including a second tower that had been exposed by earlier cleaning in the area by the Sinop uh, Museum. Textual references uh, mention a fortification wall at Sinop at least as early as the 4th century BCE, when the Persian satrap Datames attacked the cities. And although no traces of a wall from that period have been identified, our excavations have identified a substantial earlier wall, um, late archaic to early classical, with a stone-faced rampart in the area of the Hellenistic wall, you can see marked here, as well as the foundations for a later Byzantine curtain wall. But regarding the Hellenistic wall, the earliest phases of the standing curtain wall can be roughly assigned to the Hellenistic period more generally, based on its construction with finely drafted isodomic masonry without mortar, bristling with massive square towers and beveled corners at irregular intervals. Other features, such as the series of arrow and bolt slots with projecting lintels, are unparalleled, however, and the wall can't be dated more precisely on purely stylistic terms. As a result, traditionally its construction has been associated with the period that Sinop was part of the was, was capital of the Pontic Kingdom in the second or early first centuries BCE. But Sinop Calais excavations uh, have provided the first stratigraphic evidence for dating the wall through our excavations of over 10 meters of the foundation trends associated with its construction. Our results indicate that the wall was built by the mid-third by the mid-third century BC, based on the pottery finds in the foundation trench. Which does, not, which does not include anything later uh, than that date. So this Western Hellenistic wall was initially constructed as a standalone curtain, but new discoveries by the Sinop Museum in recent years have indicated that the defenses of Sinop A in this period were supplemented by ones to the east of the urban center. Uh, former Sinop Museum director, uh, Hussein Viral has recently discovered a tower featuring isodomic masonry with reserved margins and ballista ports very similar to the masonry employed in our Western Hellenistic wall, um, suggesting that a second curtain wall or perhaps a harbor fortification existed here during the Hellenistic period. In addition, the museum has also recently excavated a Hellenistic harbor structure in the same area, allowing the early urban form of Sinope in this period to slowly emerge. Placing Sinope's fortification wall in this early Hellenistic context, the first half of the third century BC, as our uh, Sinope Cali excavation works indicates it belongs, suggests then that it is another example of Sinope participating in early Hellenistic networks of socio-political interactions in the Black Sea region. The new and technologically sophisticated monumental stone fortification at Sinope was defensive to be sure, but needs to be understood <laughs> as a display of strength and prosperity of Sinop in the context of a broader investment in large scale, uh, in, in, in the context of the broader investment of the large scale forts, uh, stone fortifications that can be seen in other cities in the Black Sea during the same period. <coughs> Our understanding of the urban development of early Sinop is expanding rapidly, thanks to topographic studies by Claire Barat and Owen Dunan, research on the Buddha archive, uh, this is uh, documentation from Ludwig Buddha's and Akram Akrigal's early and largely unpublished excavations in Synops in the 1950s. This is work that um, I've been doing with my colleagues Ulrika Kroscheck and Sue Sherek, who's here tonight, uh, and, uh, and especially excavations conducted by the Synop Museum throughout the city. All of these are contributing to our understanding of what early Synop looked like. 
One of the most exciting finds has been the evidence, well, for me at least, uh, has been the evidence for expansion of ancient Sinope to the east onto the slopes of the Bostepe Peninsula, where with a series of villas that have been dated to the fourth century BCE. These villas are characterized by stone pebble mosaic floors with often elaborate vegetal motifs and figural scenes. The first of these mosaics was actually discovered by Akagal and Buddha in the sec uh, under the second century uh, BC temple that is now in the garden of the archeological museum and only published um, briefly. But more recent museum excavations have found part or whole pebble mosaics in six other sites further east on the slopes of Baztepe. And just last year, Professor, uh, Professor Gugin Korolu of Mimar Sina Fine Arts <coughs> University, uh, her excavations at the Baladar complex have uncovered another, you can see the tweet here um, about that. Professor Hazar Kaba from Sinop University and Ere Aksoe from Sinop, Muse Sinop Archaeological Museum have recently published the mosaics from one of these vi uh, villas in the Yalnizlar neighborhood the first full publication of any of the Sinop mosaics. This paper, published in Anatolian Studies last year, is dedicated in memory of Gina, who strongly encouraged the authors from the early st stages of the article's preparation. And I'm really glad, pleased to be able to present the results of it here tonight. Kaba and Adesoy, uh, Aksoy present the two surviving mosaics from the villa, one with the Macedonian star style, Macedonian style star surrounded by a vegetal motif, and the other with a central scene of Arotes hunting a lion griffin, surrounded by a band of Arotes riding sea creatures. The authors identify these mosaics as belonging to antechambers of Andronates, rooms where men could ga would gather to drink in the symposium. The mosaics date to the, uh, the mid-4th century BCE and have strong parallels in terms of iconography to other examples from the Aegean Greek world, and in particular with the famous pebble mosaics from Pella the capital of the Macedonian kingdom. The Yal uh, Nislar house, like the others with pebble mosaics, was located on a terrace overlooking the city and the sea on the slopes of Baztepe. Unlike this recent view from the slopes of Baztepe, in ancient times this would have been an extra urban setting in between the city and the newly developed territory, uh, agricultural territory on Baztepe. It's not hard to imagine that the owner of the Yalnizlar house was in some way connected to the prosperity associated with the agri agricultural production on that land. The mosaics there were designed to display status and wealth and thus played a role in elite competition in Sinope. There are, few, there are a few other uh, pebble mosaics known from the Black Sea region, but these are understudied and not well published. Nonetheless, it is clear that Sinope was a significant center for this type of floor uh, decoration in the region, and the city's wealthy elite developed a fashion for decorating their new, extra, their new extra urban houses in this way. This particular type of elite display may have been unique to Sinope in the Black Sea world, but there is one place where we can see elite display and competition in uh, the 4th and 3rd centuries BC everywhere in the Black Sea, the funereal realm, especially monumental burials. Prosperity, at least amongst elite groups, is reflected in monumental burial traditions and rich assemblages, uh, rich burial assemblages that can be found in various uh, iterations around the Black Sea during the period we've been focusing on. Perhaps most famously, in, it is in this period when we see the largest and most lavishly provisioned burials of elite in the non-Greek populations around the Black Sea, especially those of Scythians and Thracians in the northern and western regions. Although these two uh, uh, these two are distinct uh, traditions. The similarities between them are clear in a formal sense, from the large size of the mounds with burial chambers and timber or stone, to the prevalence of horses, bur horse burials, tack and imagery, as well as lavish burial assemblages that included gold and silver armor, vessels, jewelry and clothing, uh, plaques, as well as uh, Greek pottery. To this picture, we can also add the so-called golden graves of Vani in the Colchis region of the, Black, uh, the Eastern Black Sea, with their pebble mounds and evidence for horse burial, as well as grave goods that included large quantities of gold and silver. They speak the same language. But as I argue in a forthcoming paper, we can also see an increasing investment in monumental and lavish burials in the Greek centers uh, uh, of this period. Um, 
And just for example, I'll show you some finds from the Pavlovsky Kurgan from the Bosporan Kingdom here. Elite in these Greek cities um, were also in, uh, engaging in competitive display at death, using some of the same monumental vocabularies of the powerful non-Greek groups around the Black Sea. The use of mounded or architecturally monumental burial markers, increasingly rich burial assemblages, and developing new styles of monumental burials that draw on those of the neighboring populations. As in other Greek cities of the Black Sea, in Sinope, it's clear that, uh, that burial was another venue for elite display and competition. For example, the marble lion and stag pedimental sculpture that is currently displayed in the Sinop Museum indicates the presence of architectural tombs from this period. <laughs> Dated from the second quarter of the fourth century BCE, the pediment was part of a large-scale architectural tomb. The sculptural group depicts two lions attacking a central stag and measures 2.2 meters long. It was discovered to the west uh, of the city along the coast um, with a view to the sea and Akhliman, ancient Hymenae. This area was part of a larger necropolis region of Sinope, but it was in a particularly prominent coastal location. The pedimental nature and style of the stag group certainly suggests a Greek architectural frame in the original, of the original monument, and Akragal and Buddha's excavations in this area in the, in the 1950s revealed multiple stone sarcophagi and an extensive stone setting with a stockel 2.8 meters long that was likely the foundation of a large architectural tomb. While in other parts of the Black Sea, burial mounds were a more, uh, more common way of marking monumental burials, architectural facades in the region of Sinop can also be found in tombs uh, of, the, of the Paphlagonian rock-cut tombs that are located in the Pontic foothills to the south of Sinop. And these earlier uh, and contemporary monuments likely impacted the vocabularies of display used by Sinopean elite, along with Monument, along with rock cut tombs from Persia and other Anatolian tomb traditions, in a similar way that, say, the Bosporan uh, elite were influenced by the mounted burials of the Scythians in their hinterland. And there were also mounded burials, there were some uh, mounded burials at Sinop, a new tradition of uh, burial mounds with rock cut chamber tombs from the Hellenistic period appeared on the Bas Tepe Peninsula. The largest group on the western side uh, slope of the city, uh, on the western slope of Bas Tepe overlooking the city, is Sahen Tepeze, while another group of these burials was located by the SRAP survey on the eastern tip, looking out to sea. Here you can see uh, these tombs in the 1950s from the Buddha archive to get a sense of their substantial mounded forms, which are much uh, degraded today. Unfortunately, most of these tombs have been looted, so it's difficult to date them precisely or to know what their burial, what burial ritual they contained. But their locations on high prominent points overlooking the sea and the settlement and the harbor were clearly designed to frame the landscape of Sinope from the sea. Similar chamber tombs have been found uh, in the hinterland of Sinope and a project by Professor Mete Aksan from Sinope University documenting all the chamber tombs in Sinope province will provide a great new perspective on the role of mounted burials in elite display and Sinope and its hinterland. In addition to burials monumentalized above ground, there are indications that rich burial assemblages were also provided for elite members of the late classical and, Hel and early Hellenistic community in Sinope. A recent example, known as the Gelenjik sarcophagus, comes from, uh, comes from a burial discovered in 2013 during construction along the main street running south out of town. It was likely the main route in antiquity as well as today. When it was flanked by uh, this burial, recently published by uh, Hazar Kaba, is dated to the late 4th century BC and consisted of a, a local limestone sarcophagus containing a female skeleton of 21 to 24 years old, as well as a rich burial assemblage. The woman was buried with a gold necklace, three rings, an alabastron, a mirror, a a bone pigment box, which may have been decorated, decorated with gold plaques, two, and two bronze coins. Her grave goods also included three attic um, imported uh, vessels and eight polychrome relief vessels, or plaquette and blossom. Kada has demonstrated that the relief vessels in this burial were part of a larger Sine Sinopean production of vessels specifically for funerary ritual, and a total of 21 of these plaquette and vases are known from Sinop. 
but relief vessels or plastic vessels uh, of, of similar style, particularly ones made in Athens for export, are found in, significant, uh, in a significant number of other Black Sea burials from this period. And the synop production of plaquette vases for burials clearly represents a local iteration of this wider tradition, both addressing the needs of local competition and engaging in a wider Black Sea network of elite consumption and display. The iconographic themes on the jewelry and the relief vessels in the Gelenjik sarcophagus also point towards connections with broader Black Sea patterns of consumption. The depiction of Thetis and Nereid, a Nereid uh, on a, riding on a hippocamp on a ring from the Gelenjik sarcophagus and uh, imagery of Europa riding a bull uh, on a relief phase uh, are particularly popular Black Sea imagery. And the prevalence of Demeter and Kore imagery on the relief phases also uh, echoes elaborate female burials from the north coast of the Black Sea. The contents of the 4th century uh, Gelenji sarcophagus suggests their rich vocabulary of elite display was looking north towards the sea, mirroring, in, mirroring the increasingly richly provisioned burials of Greek settlements on the north and west coasts, and ultimately nodding to lavish assemblages of the monumental burials in other parts of the Black Sea. In ancient Sinope and its immediate hinterland, there were not monumental burials on the scale of those of the western and northern and even eastern regions of the Black Sea. But it's clear that during the late classical and early Hellenistic period, monumentality in the form of architectural tombs, lavish burials, and new mounted burial traditions enters the elite vocabulary in ways that, referencing, uh, that reference monumentalizing traditions in other parts of the Black Sea. At the same time, there are also clear connections with contemporary elite burial practices from the Pontic mountain range to the south of Sinope, particularly in the territory of Paphlagonia. To conclude, I hope I have demonstrated to you the ways in which ancient Sinope was an integral part of the political and economic networks that created an environment of prosperity and competition in the Black Sea during the 4th and 3rd centuries BCE. The recent work that has been done in Sinop has been vital to my task of bringing Sinope and the south coast of the Black Sea into dialogue with the rest of the region. Without this holistic inter integration, our understanding of ancient Sinope and indeed of the larger Black Sea uh, region would only be partial. Excavation work continues apace in Sinop, with the recent develop of the Sinop Valalik Medani and the construction of the, uh, the culture, the recent construction of the cultural center in the area of the Western Kunkapa necropolis. Our colleagues at Sinop University are very active, working in conjunction with museum staff to publish uh, material, and there are prospects for future international collaborations. It is exciting to contemplate how our understanding of ancient Sinope will unfold in the years to come, an excitement I'm sure Gina would share. The BIA has a long tradition of supporting work at Sinop, of which Gina was such a valued part. I'm grateful for their support for my work and that of my colleagues through publications, and for this opportunity to speak about Sinop in honor of Gina today. Thank you.